Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Monday, April 10, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Rebels killed over 20 people in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Residents of the region say shortly before the attack, the rebels introduced themselves to the population as part of the government army who were there to provide security. The multi-stakeholders forum in Eswatini plans to petition the United Nations this week to investigate the killing of human rights lawyer Dulani Masiko. Sudanese Muslims observe Ramadan despite their country's economic wars. We will take a fresh look at the political implications of former President Donald Trump's indictment. Ebos in Nigeria make another demand for their own country. We are in a, a country where we are not wanted. What we are doing now is to call our people together and let us fight for the new nation and get away from the evil nation called Nigeria. And civil society activists criticize the use of pit toilets in South African schools. Those stories plus something Omali sports are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Rebels in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo killed more than 20 people between Friday and Saturday. Local authorities in the Benin region of North Kivu province say rebels linked to the Allied Democratic Forces, or ADF, beheaded most of the victims. From Goma, Zanep Neti Zaide has the story. The killings took place in the villages of Musandaba, Misenge and Emubula in the Benimbao sector in the territory of Beni. Residents of the region say shortly before the attack, the rebels introduced themselves to the population as part of the government army who were there to provide security. It was only a moment later that many people realized that they were facing ADF rebels. He says, as a Noicha resident, he resents the army because it is not able to provide security to Beni territory and town. He says he wants them to come to the funerals and tell people what is really going on. He says they are going to keep dying, and even now they have been informed that other people have just been killed. Kasapari Otama, an activist of the pressure group Veranda Mutanga, denounced the failure of the DRC's armed forces to provide security. He says that a moment before the killings, the population was already warning about the presence of rebels in the area and he demands the presence of the authorities, including police and the military, in the territory of Oicha. He says they ask themselves where are the authorities. They urge the governor of the province to come to Oicha to bury the bodies. The recent killings come 48 hours after Congolese and Ugandan army chiefs visited the area with both armies combining forces to fight the ADF rebels. The spokesman of the joint operation, Lieutenant Kono Makazukai, says the rebels are committing acts of violence against those fleeing the fighting. He says some of the leaders have been killed and the army has managed to destroy many of the enemy's strongholds. They have also managed to dismantle the supply networks of the rebels and he says the military will continue its operations until it reaches its goal of defeating the ADF. In an official statement broadcast of its official channel, the Islamic State claimed responsibility for the attack. For VOA Africa, Amzanem Netizaidi in Goma. In Nigeria, the spokesperson for the group Indigenous People of Biafra, or IPOB, says ethnic Igbos should have their own country because they are no longer wanted in today's Nigeria. Emma Powerful says Igbos are treated differently in many respects, including denial of their right to peacefully protest the continued incarceration of their leader, Nandi Kanu. 
while at the same time allowing Shiite Muslims to demonstrate. He also claims that Peter Obi, who came third in the February 25 presidential election, was denied the presidency because he is Igbo. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, declared Bola Tinubu the winner over Atiku Abubakar and Obi. Emma Powerful tells me the federal government of Nigeria should hold a referendum among Igbos to test the popularity of becoming an independent nation. What you say is truth. I am speaking on behalf of IPOB, not on behalf of Ndebo, because IPOB or Biafra is not only Igbo. We are comprises of many tribes in Biafra. If you see what is happening in Nigeria right now, you will understand that Igbos are no more wanted in the country called Nigeria. Why do you say that? On the 3rd of this month, IPOB protested in Aba, Abia states, peacefully, and was attacked by Nigeria security agents. On that attack, we lost many people. Many people are, were arrested. Many dead bodies are missing. But on the 6th of this very month, the Shiite Islamic movement protested in Abuja for the government to release their leader's SSS Zaki international passport for him to go to travel out and uh, get a normal treatment. Nobody attacked them. Nobody killed them. They protested the 30th of March. Nobody attacked them. But uh, why our, our own is different? So that is why we said we are no more wanted in Nigeria. You can see at the same time, during the February 25th presidential election, an Igbo man, Peter Obi, won election because he's the said he's an Igbo man. No Igbo man will rule the country. It's unfortunate. We are in a, a country where we are not wanted. What we are doing now is to call our people, let them come together and know that they are not wanted, and let us fight for the new nation and get away from the evil nation called Nigeria. The Igbos are a large part of Nigeria's population. Is it fair to say that they are not wanted? Yes, they are not wanted. If you are in Nigeria, you will understand that Igbos are doing everything to keep Nigeria at one, but... These people are pushing us to the wall. And we are ready to go. We are planning to go out of the country. Isn't that insurrection, meaning you are preaching for Igbos to secede from Nigeria? We are not part of the country before. Therefore, we are not seceding. What we are looking for is who we are before. So somebody telling us that we are seceding, that person is making a mistake. Biafra is in the map of the world. Before Nigeria was created in 1960, I don't see the reason why we are succeeding from what we are not part of before. We are not succeeding. We are looking for our freedom. We want to have our own government. Our fathers fought in 1967, 1670. They killed us more than 5 million. After killing us, they said they will rehabilitate, reconstruct, and they re- reintegrate the three hours. And none of these things, none was even implemented. We have suffered in this country. The Igbos are not wanted from Nigeria. Now, is this a, a popular view in the Igbo uh, That's nation? That's why if, if they say the thing is not uh, popular support, let them do a referendum for us to confirm whether we are popular or not. If they win or if, I, if we win them, they give us our freedom. That was Emma Powerful, the spokesperson for the indigenous people of Biafra. You are speaking with us from Nigeria. In Eswatini, formerly Swaziland, the Multi-Stakeholders Forum says it will present a petition on Wednesday this week to the UN Resident Coordinator's Office for the International Governing Body to investigate the assassination of Tulani Maseko. Tulani, the chair of the Multi-Stakeholders Forum and a human rights lawyer, was killed in his home in January. An Eswatini spokesperson told VOA the government had launched an investigation into his killing. But Foreign Minister Tuli Dratla reportedly said last week that the government did not murder Maseko, but rather he was killed because of infighting within the pro-democracy movement over land and financial disputes. Sikilela Dlamini is the Secretary General of the Multi-Stakeholders Forum. He tells me that the suggestion of any pro-democracy members' involvement in Maseko's death is a strategy to divide the group. He says the purpose of Wednesday's petition is for the UN to take the lead in the investigation because the Eswatini public yawned for answers.
I can say that it is unfortunate that the minister is talking about an outcome or processes of an investigation whose report has not been made public and yet government promised to do the investigation and that they will come up with an investigation report. And then with regards to what is circulating. Exactly that. I wanted to ask you that about the so-called private group that have been making some so-called comments on the assassination of uh, Maseko. What do you know about that yes. so-called private group? No, I don't know the group, but I believe it's just a group of people who want to push a narrative that will point to the direction of saying it is members of the mass democratic movement that assassinated Tulani. It is a strategy to further divide the mass democratic movement. It's an unfounded allegation, uh, so we may not want to believe it. What we are looking upon, we are looking upon a report that is going to be conducted by an independent investigation team that is going to follow processes that we are going to trust. We don't want to involve ourselves on things that are being said by a group such as that one. We believe that those who, who did this satanic act of killing another, they must be brought to justice. It's very strange because this so-called report that we are talking about it goes to associate the assassination of uh, Maseko with his wife. Where do you think this information is coming from? It is possible for anyone to come up with a narrative that people are going to believe in. Knowing Maseko and his wife, the chain of life that they've traveled, and the battles that they've won together, it is highly unlikely that she can be part of a plot to kill her very own husband, a person to whom he has been indebted for so many years, because he herself is a comrade. The petition that you are going to deliver on Wednesday, what is the purpose of the petition? The purpose of the petition is to say to the United Nations resident officer, we will be giving the UN office a vote of confidence in saying we trust that they can be able to assist the source nation in this regard into saying they can be able to influence the constitution of, of an investigation team that will investigate the death of Masego because the nation and the rest of the mass democratic movement still awaits answers as to who killed Tulan. But also other factors that are going to be included are issues to the effect that we also need to scale up our pressure on the authorities of the country to say the country needs to democratize. And there is a need and an urgent one that an urgent inclusive political dialogue is convened so that the future of the country is agreed upon by the sources. Sikilale Dramini, thank you so much again. A pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. My pleasure too, my leader. Sikile Ladramini is the Secretary General of the Multi Stakeholders Forum of Eswatini, formerly Swaziland. You are speaking with me from the capital, Mbabane. President Donald Trump's arraignment in New York on 34 felony charges, his lawyers have begun working on his defense. This is just the first of several investigations that Trump faces and that, according to some experts, could have very serious consequences for him and his political future. Veronica Baldera Iglesias has the details. Never in American history has a former president faced criminal charges, much less one who is attempting another run for the White House. It's an insult to our country as the world is already laughing at us. Donald Trump was charged this week with falsifying New York business records to conceal his role in paying hush money to an adult film actress before the 2016 election. In the week since the announcement of the indictment, Trump raked in $12 million in campaign donations, suggesting the criminal charges may be helpful to him, at least in the short term, said political consultant Julie Roginski via Zoom. It really creates an aura of victimhood around him, which is something that Republicans have lately made a hallmark of their party and a hallmark of their electoral um, strategy. After his indictment, polls showed Trump widening his lead over his likely Republican challenger, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Should he become the Republican nominee, in November 2024, Trump will likely face President Joe Biden, again, just like in 2020, 
which could mean good news for Biden, as it likely would galvanize the Democratic base and most independent voters, said Larry Sabato, director of the University of Virginia Center for Politics, via Skype. Biden is the kind of candidate who isn't going to generate millions and millions of votes because of his personality. He's going to generate those votes because they can't stand the alternative. Trump will make his first court appearance in December. If he is found guilty and still wins the election, there's nothing in the Constitution that would bar him from being commander-in-chief. While this case is unlikely to land Trump any jail time, other criminal investigations, including on his role in efforts to overturn the 2020 election results, could lead to more serious charges and potential imprisonment. Richard Pierce, a law professor at George Washington University via Skype. I don't know how one could uh, be effective as president of the United States while being in, in a jail cell, but there is nothing in the Constitution that would keep somebody from being president of the United States and being incarcerated uh, uh, at the same time. But elections are not decided only by personalities. Other than the economy, which is looking increasingly positive for Biden, the incumbent, there are the so-called wedge issues that motivate American voters. Clifford Young, president for U.S. Public Affairs at Ipsos via Skype. Issues like immigration and crime, which are very important for Republicans that motivate that base, um, or issues like social equality, uh, women's reproductive rights, um, you know, uh, safe democracy, which are all issues that motivate Democrats. We saw those issues motivating voters in the midterms this last year, um, and we expect to see it in 2024 as well. Biden has not officially announced he is running for re-election. He likely do it when he doesn't have to share the political spotlight with Trump. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News, Washington. Despite their country's economic woes, Muslims in Sudan are observing the holy month of Ramadan with customs that include sharing iftar with travelers. Seed Ahmed Ibrahim spoke to residents in Khartoum and has this report. Cars rush past as young people spread carpets for prayer. And this is what the streets of Khartoum look like moments before Muslims in the city break their fast to an evening meal. Sudanese people observe the holy month of Ramadan with special rituals that include decorating the streets and preparing food. A resident of the Al Da'in neighborhood says it is customary for men to break their fast in the streets. <laughs> It's one of our customs to gather and break the fasting in the streets daily during Ramadan. The purpose of this practice is also to share food with people who might not be able to reach their destination on time. These are rituals celebrated for decades all over Sudan. Economic strain, residents say, is also felt in the streets. They say there is a lack of basic staple foods, including the wheat flour used in asida, a common dish in the Arab world, and other food items people depend on during Ramadan. It's clear that the prices are increasing. Everything is increasing. We thank God for everything. Even though we have to adapt to that uncertain economic situation in the country, which makes us suffer to meet our daily needs. The prices of the meats are settled, but the vegetables are not. We don't have a choice except to be patient and help each other with our non-Sudanese hospitality. Ramadan remains a special month for the Sudanese who strive to preserve its rituals and uniqueness. For Sid Ahmed Ibrahim in Khartoum, Sudan, I'm Vincent Makori, VOA News. The South African government's battle with citizens over the continued use of pit toilets in schools shows signs of letting up anytime soon. Primitive pit toilets are still being used in hundreds of schools across the country. Over the past few years, several students have fallen into the latrine pits and died. Tusu Kumalo has more from Johannesburg. The latest standoff between the government and civil society organizations was sparked by the death of a four-year-old child in the Eastern Cape province. Her body was found in a school pit toilet after she did not return home. Several other school children have died in the same manner over the past nine years. Section 27, a public interest law center advocating for equality and social justice, says 
in the Limpopo province alone, over 65,000 students are using pit toilets. Last week, Section 27 launched an accountability tool to monitor progress towards eradicating pit toilet in the Limpopo province. Faranaz Veriava, head of education at Section 27, told the gathering there has been slow progress despite a 2021 court ruling demanding a concrete plan be put forward to abolish the toilets. The Center for Child Law is one of many organizations that have joined Section 27 in demanding flush toilets for students. For VOA News, I am Tusokumalo in Johannesburg.